Welcome to Difficult Dialogues, Voices from the Valley. I'm Lynn Pascarella, President of Mount Holyoke College. Difficult Dialogues is intended to bring to bear voices from the Valley on some of the most complex social and ethical issues of the day. Today, it's my pleasure to be joined by Professor Stephen Jones, who is a professor, professor of Russian Studies and Eurasian Studies at Mount Holyoke College. Stephen, you're also a professor in international relations. Mm. And one of the most critical issues facing the world today is what's going on in the Ukraine. Over the summer, uh, in July, there was a, a Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 that was shot down. Mm -hmm. And there was a flurry of activity in the news about this mm -hmm. incident. And yet, the issues in the Ukraine have seemed to disappear from, from the public uh, front pages. So tell us what's going on in the Ukraine. Well, it is extraordinary that it has disappeared from the front pages when you consider the critical nature of this crisis. Uh, we have a war in the middle of Europe. Um, the war has somewhat diminished, which may explain uh, the, uh, the attention of newspapers going elsewhere. But currently, in the last month or so, there has been a ceasefire agreement between Russia and Ukraine. So in that sense, the situation has somewhat stabilized, although fighting continues. The broader problem, of course, is how is this situation going to be resolved? Um, what uh, is Europe, what action will Europe take? What action will the United States take? And what are Russia's intentions uh, in Europe? Are they going to stay in Ukraine? Is this part of a revisionist power, great power, namely Russia, uh, expanding and trying to gain new territories um, in Europe? Or, um, or is it simply uh, a defensive move by Russia, fearful of the expansion of NATO and European influence eastwards? It's a, an interesting question, um, but you know, the crisis fundamentally continues. Uh, people are still dying, um, and we have reached a position of stasis. There's been a long history of conflict in the region. The most recent conflict um, was really precipitated in part by, by disagreement over the president of Ukraine and the alliance with the European Union. Can you take us back to that point and talk about the vote that happened there, why the president left power, and the results of that? So um, let, let, let's go back even a little bit further mm. and, and talk about Ukraine's position in Europe. One of the very interesting aspects of Ukraine is the nature of Ukrainian society. When we look at this conflict, many experts and academics have analyzed it in terms of an east-west conflict. Uh, the western part of Ukraine was annexed by the Soviet Union after World War II um, and has a very different history from the eastern part of Ukraine. The western part is the center, let's say, of a much deeper attachment to Ukrainian nationalism. The eastern part is much more mixed with, with the Russian population, large Russian population. However, the east-west conflict within Ukraine, I think, is somewhat s simplistic because there are many Russians, for example, uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine, ethnic Russians, who will speak fluent Ukrainian and who identify with the Ukrainian state. So they will argue what Russia did was wrong. They are, let's say, patriots and loyal to uh, the Ukrainian state, the preservation of Ukrainian state. Um, so this division between ethnic Russians and uh, Ukrainian nationalists, I think, has to be tempered with a much more uh, subtle or complex uh, analysis of relations between Russians and Ukrainians and their, the, and their attitude towards Ukrainian state. Um, the conflict, so part of the conflict or part of the problem has been Ukraine's inability really, despite a number of revolutions, I'm thinking in particular the Orange Revolution of 2004, to integrate Ukraine and make it into a, a stable, democratic and relatively prosperous state. So that there are, there are weaknesses in Ukraine and in society and in terms of political polarization that Russia has been able to exploit. So that's been a, a that's, I think, it's a structural problem. It's a, 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 a problem of, of government weakness. 
Um, so Russia has a very um, particular attitude towards Ukraine because Ukraine for so long was part of the Russian sphere of influence, part of the Russian Empire and then part of the Soviet Union. So loss of Ukraine for Russia was a, a very significant blow, um, particularly given that it coincided with the advance of um, Western power and NATO. Um, so for Russia, the loss of Ukraine and its movement to the West uh, when, uh, for example, this was, I think you're referring to the association agreement that uh, Ukraine signed in 2012, 2013, um, when um, it, it committed itself to further European integration. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, for Russia, you know, this was just a, a, a further layer upon the layers that already trouble it about what's happening in Ukraine. Namely, uh, you know, historically, Ukraine was part of Russia and then now seems to be, it seems to be lost. Um, it's also a strategic issue because of the advancement of NATO and now it seems Ukraine wants to join the European Union which will pull Ukraine further and further away uh, from that Russian sphere of influence. Um, so that's where we are now I, I guess in terms of how Russia looks at it and the Europeans you know, wanting to um, not take Ukraine in as a European Union member, but to integrate it as part of an Eastern partnership, that's what they call it. Uh, so it would become closer uh, to the European Union, but not a member. There's been some criticism by the part of people in Ukraine about the fact that they haven't been given more support by the Europeans and uh, charges that this is a result of Europeans' reliance on gas and oil from Russia. And, Tell us about that. Is there, there truth to that claim? Yes. Um, you know, Europe, European countries, and it depends on which country we're talking about, but overall they depend on 30% uh, of their gas supplies from Russia. And Russia knows that. On the other hand, it's always worth remembering that al although there is this European dependence on, on energy from Russia, there is also a Russian dependence on Europe for revenues from that, from that uh, gas mm -hmm. supply. So it's a, a mutual relationship. This is perhaps why Putin is hesitating in terms of his next step in Ukraine. You know, it could be disastrous for Russia um, if, for example, Europeans do find other sources of, of energy, which they are actively looking for now because it's clear Russia is no longer a reliable partner for supply of gas. Um, you know, this could be very serious blow in the medium term, at least, to the Russian economy. The Russian economy is, in terms of its revenues from exports, almost 70 to 80 percent of it is raw materials, and most of that is gas and oil. So it's a raw material dependent economy. And should it lose its market in Europe, that would be just a, a very serious blow. And what about the policy of the United States? Do you think that Secretary Kerry and President Obama are doing enough? I think for uh, the United States, the problem is they don't really know what they can do. Um, it's a very complicated situation and you're dealing with a great power uh, that has uh, a massive arsenal of nuclear weapons. Um, and at the same time, the United States is facing numerous crises in other parts of the world. Um, they are probably less attentive to the situation, although I would argue they should be more attentive, uh, given that what we're facing, as I mentioned in my, in my response to your first question, is uh, you know, a really critical crisis in Europe. Um, but their, their lack of response may, in some sense, um, be determined by the fact that you, the United States is l much less affected by what happens in its relations with Russia than, say, the Europeans. Mm. And one of the issues is uh, the United States now is largely or is becoming energy independent in the way that Europe is not. Uh, and its trade relations with Russia are pretty minimal in a way that, again, Europe uh, is not. Europe uh, has uh, very, and particularly Germany, has very significant trade relations um, with Russia. This may partly explain the Europeans' reluctance um, to take more decisive action.
against Russia, although it must be said the sanctions that have been taken so far are having an impact. Uh, this year, the first six months of this year, for example, there has been a $75 billion capital flight from Russia. Um, and that is almost twice the amount of the previous year, previous six months in the previous year. So uh, it's, although these policies that are being pursued by the West are rather cautious and incremental, let's say, uh, it does seem that they are having some impact. It's quite extraordinary. Some pundits say that this is the beginning of a new Cold War. Others say it's not like the Cold War at all. What do you think? Well, uh, yeah, I, th I would agree that this is a um, something like the Cold War situation. It's a real media in uh, Russian-U.S. relations, Russian-European -Euro relations. I can't remember a period like this since the collapse of the Soviet Union where the relations have been so bad. Um, and, you know, the question is what, is, what are Russia's goals here and what, what is Russia's strategy at this stage if, if they continue the, this uh, territorial expansion, um, it, it could end up um, you know, in, uh, into, a very, in, into a very critical situation, particularly in the eastern parts of, of Europe. Uh, the Baltic Republics of Lithuania, Estonia and Latvia are shaking in their boots right now as to what Russia will do next. Uh, it's not good for other non-Russian republics, former republics of the Soviet Union that are now independent like Georgia and Armenia, Azerbaijan, that um, you know, if, for example, Russia succeeds in maintaining its strategy in Ukraine, um, that's not good news for, for these other states in terms of their relations with Russia. It means Russia in some sense has been given a, I wouldn't say green light, but maybe an amber light. By, by European states, um, and um, this may mean a new line will be drawn between uh, Western Europe and those other countries that formerly were part of the Soviet Union and now will be part of the Russian sphere of influence. There's been much speculation about Putin's motives, about his mental stability. What do you think Putin's end game is? Hard to say. Um, I'm not even sure whether he knows what his end game is. There, there's a lot of speculation about uh, is there a long-term strategy here or is this, as I suggested earlier, simply a defensive move uh, by Russia? Um, of course, when one analyzes it, one has to think of Putin because uh, he is running a country on a system that he calls the power vertical. The power vertical means that essentially uh, most of the decisions that are of, of any significance are made by one person, by President Putin. We can be pretty sure that the decisions about the in invasion of Georgia in 2008 um, and of Crimea um, earlier this year and, and currently Eastern Ukraine, these were decisions that were made with a very small circle of advisors uh, by President Putin, but this was his decision essentially. Um, I'm not sure about mental instability. I, you know, he, at some level, is also very pragmatic. Uh, this is uh, a game playing for him to increase the influence of Russia. He's not looking for a world war or anything like that. It's a very risky game that he is playing but he thinks he can get something out of it to Russia. So in that sense, you know, it, it could be argued it's strategic, it's pragmatic, it's not the action of a madman. Yeah, I'm a medical ethicist and I've been reading recently about the visible reminders of the conflict and how it's difficult for those who have been injured, who've lost limbs in the war to get prostheses, to get any kind of adequate medical care and to come back together as a, a family or a community. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk about the morale of the people in the region. In Ukraine, um, let me just tell you first that in Russia, morale is good. Uh, not 
as far as the economy is concerned, mm. because as I said, the economy is in trouble, although Russia has uh, significant reserves, uh, foreign currency reserves in particular. So the Russian government, uh, despite the war, can cushion some of the impacts on the Russian population. So for the Russian population, it doesn't as yet mean any significant decrease in living standards or any rations or crises or anything of that kind. Um, and Putin, as a result of his activities both in Crimea um, and Ukraine, has gained in popularity in Russia. So he won the last presidential election in, in, um, in 2012 with about 64% of the vote. Now um, the polls tell us he has something like 80% support. So you know, this is good for Putin, but it's probably in the long term it's obviously not mm. good for Russia because this will have an impact on the Russian economy. Um, as far as Ukrainians are concerned, there's, yes, there's a deep crisis. Um, and it goes back, I think, to what I said earlier about the problems of nation building in Ukraine and the creation of civil society. The economy is, is absolutely devastated. Um, they are in recession. Uh, you know, it's something like projected minus six, seven cent loss in GDP um, over the next year or two. Uh, and the Europeans and the, the Americans arguably are not doing enough to try and um, stimulate the Ukrainian economy, get it back on its feet. So people are suffering immensely from the economic crisis in Ukraine. They're also suffering, as you said, from the fact that they are at war. The fact that as far as Ukraine, many Ukrainians are concerned, um, a foreign power is occupying their territory. You can imagine how Americans mm -hmm. might feel about that. Um, and it has shown the weakness of Ukrainian army. And now we know up to 3,000 people have died in this conflict. As I said, people are still dying. I don't think I would compare it to Vietnam syndrome that the United States experienced when Vietnam veterans mm. came home and all these problems that were associated with their rehabilitation and their reintegration into society. It's not uh, at that stage yet. Um, but if this, if this goes on, um, it means that uh, Ukraine, and this may be is Putin's strategy, will really not become integrated in Europe in any way. It cannot be while a foreign power is, is occupying its territory. And of course, it does mean there will be no investment in Ukraine. It means that the economy will continue to slide. So for ordinary Ukrainians, it's absolutely devastating. To what extent is the high morale in Russia a reflection of the government's control over the media? It's, it reflects that enormously. Um, all the major TV stations, which 70 to 80 percent of the Russian population get their news from, um, are, owned by, are, are controlled by the state. So um, they are getting a completely distorted uh, image of what's going on in Ukraine. There is the internet, um, but this still um, access to the internet is still an issue in Russia, and it's generally the younger generation who can access it, and uh, so it doesn't have that much effect. Although, as I said, there there is access to alternative sources of information through the internet. So most people watch TV, and most people get the message that um, Ukraine is uh, currently run by. Uh, neo-fascists in, in the government and that they are killing Russians uh, in eastern Ukraine. Um, so you will get pictures of um, schools and hospitals that have been damaged allegedly by Ukrainian shells. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's a very effective system of propaganda. You're an internationally recognized researcher and scholar mm -hmm. in the region. Uh, tell us about your own work. Okay, so uh, the reason, one of the reasons I'm interested in Ukraine is because I've done most of my work over the last 35 years or so on the Caucasus. Uh, the Caucasus is, uh, this, let's say, the, the s formerly the southern region of the Soviet Union, now comprised three independent states, Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. And to the north, of course, is the region of Chechnya. Uh, 
So this is a, a very difficult, volatile region. There's a war still going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh. And Georgia also experienced a similar thing that Ukraine has experienced now in 2008 when there was a Russian invasion uh, of Georgia. Um, it's, um, so, you know, Georgia uh, and the, those other Caucasian states are looking very attentively to what will happen um, in Ukraine because it will clearly have major impact. On the other hand, um, I specialize in Georgia. Uh, Georgia has been despite a decade of civil war and, and, and complete chaos in the 1990s, has raised itself, let's say, uh, beyond that traumatic period um, and is doing relatively well economically. It is democratic by, by however we measure it. Um, and the United States has um, significant interest in preserving and promoting a democratic model, one of the only really democratic models that has come out of, of the Soviet Union. I'm talking about Georgia. Um, it's, it's for, for the United States and for Europe, it's an example that democracy building can work because it's failed miserably in most of the other places. I'm thinking about Central Asia. Ukraine really has not managed to achieve those goals. Uh, Moldova, more or less. Um, the Baltic republics are exceptional for a number of reasons and they're already part of uh, the European Union. So, you know, Georgia has become strategically quite important for Europe um, and the United States in terms of uh, preserving its democratic uh, coherence and also because of its location, of course, it's quite it's right um, on, the, on the border of the Middle East. Um, so. Um, some of the materials that go into Afghanistan and uh, they go through Georgia. So it's important for that reason. Mm. Is there a way to move forward? In Ukraine? Yes. I do think there is. Um, again, I'm generally a very optimistic uh, person. So um, I think, although it's an extraordinarily difficult situation because you know, Russia is very hard to talk to, particularly now that Putin realizes that the advances he's made in, at, domestically at home because of this, you know, he doesn't want to lose those. It's very hard for him to retreat from this situation. How does he retreat? And um, many in the West are arguing that somehow um, Europe, the United States, has to give him a window. They have to let him retreat gracefully, not with a slap in the face that will affect his uh, ratings at home. Putin, I think, has adopted this stance in part because he knows the economy is increasingly on the rocks in Russia. This is one way, I, I don't want to put it simplistically, but it's one way to di divert the population's apprehensions about the future in Russia. Um, so for him, it's, it's a very difficult situation. On the other hand, I think there are common security interests between Europe, Russia, the United States. I'm thinking of ISIS or the Islamic mm -hmm. State, for example. Uh, common interests which can be built upon. There are opportunities there. And I think there are opportunities of some form of at least military disengagement in Ukraine. It may mean that Russia will continue to have some influence, let's say. Uh, not legal influence, but political influence on developments in the eastern part of Ukraine. But I see no objection, for example, to the creation of a federation in Ukraine in which eastern Ukraine will have greater autonomy. Um, the fear that the Ukrainian government has is that you know, Russia will exploit this and, and will interfere in Ukrainian politics. But I do think there are opportunities here that Ukrainians, why not, can think about a decentralized uh, federal system and Russia um, 
as long as it, it retreated militarily, um, could have some uh, not right of participation in, 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 in the interests of, of Russians in Ukraine, but could be recognized as a power that does have interests in, the, in the eastern Ukraine that should be recognized. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise on these issues of critical importance with respect to global security. Thank you.